The Lord be with you. The First Presbyterian Church wishes to welcome all of you to worship today, whether in person or online. If you're visiting with us today, uh, we're glad to have you here. We would ask visitors to find an orange-colored visitor's information card in a pew, fill it out, and place it in the offering plate later in the service. Also, if you, would, if you have a prayer request, um, you could please fill out the prayer card and put that there, too. Okay. <laughs> Announcements now. Here you go. Maybe you saw on the announcement slides and church email, et cetera, et cetera, that we are reinstating sensibility today. Um, and, and I just said the same. Sarah just said, oh, shoot, which means she forgot to bring her change. I did the same thing. Um, but we are taking sensibility, and it, all, that, all the money collected by sensibility, it's once every two months, um, goes to the food pantry. And talking to the food pantry folks, um, we are going to be using the money that we collect to buy those extra things for the extra shelves downstairs, those things that the food pantry does not normally or ever buy, um, but that if you were going to the grocery store, things like ketchup and mustard and you know, certain things like that that don't show up in a normal, um, a normal selection from the food pantry. But our, our, if, you go, if you're trying to put food on your table, sometimes you like a little ketchup on your hamburger or mustard on your hot dog or whatever. So, so that's where the money is going to go for those types of things. So, um, but that'll be today. The kids are going to do that at the end of... Uh, yep, I see Miss Deborah's over here at the end of children's moment. She's got her buckets over here ready to go. So it may not be real noisy today from some of us who forgot our change, but uh, that's okay too. It doesn't need to be noisy. It can be a, it can be a silent sensibility. <laughs> Ow. Shocking, shocking. Um, I, have, I have one announcement, the hospitality and fellowship a committee is putting together, uh, I, I, maybe you remember we did soup and a movie with um, All Saints. It was uh, uh, the Episcopal Church then, but we did, I think that's who we did it with. And um, so anyway, we did that, um, and we're going to do that again um, here, at this, uh, here at this church. We're inviting everybody, but um, that we'll be doing that here on it's a Lenten series, just three, um, three, uh, three weeks in a row. It'll be March 22nd, March 29th, and April 5th. And um, the movie part is going to be based on the TV show Joan of Arcadia. That was, in, that was a show that was in... Um, the 90s, and it's a, um, based on a high school student who God comes to her and gives her jobs to do. <laughs> and she's not really very cooperative most of the time. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so anyway, the, it, and the lessons that come from that. And there is a Presbyterian um, Bible study that goes with that movie, the, that, that set of shows. So we'll be working from that. We'll do three of those. And if people like it, then um, we'll d continue it. it. And definitely, if you have any um, middle schoolers or high, high schoolers, I think it would be a good, good thing for them to see, or if you know somebody you might want to invite. So uh, anyway, that's, that's what we're planning. Oh. And we're going to make soup, so we're hoping to have some help with the soup. If anybody wants to help by making soup, let me know. Okay. Um, please take a moment to share the love and peace of Christ with your brothers and sisters. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Sorry. Well, just to go along with the, uh, the soup and uh, the movie, we're also going to have uh, children activities on those same dates, uh, but it's going to be for all ages. Um, we'll have devotion time and then activity time while the adults are doing their movie and 
we all are going to have, we're going to add children's food to the dinner. So it'll be a family night instead of just an adult night. Okay. Okay, now, uh, please take a moment to share the love and peace of Christ with your brothers and sisters around you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. All who are able, please stand for the gathering song. Let us enter our time of worship and prayer. Gracious God, make each of us an instrument of your grace. Weave us into a community, excuse me, showing forth your power and tenderness. Bless us in our differences and undergird our courage to stand together. We call on you today to gather us in your love Lead us to better know you and glorify you on each step of the journey of our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Please join with me in our responsive call to worship. Trust in the Lord. Take delight in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. We We trust trust in God. God. We ask for justice and shine God's light. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for God. Our salvation salvation comes from the Lord, who is our refuge and our strength. Let Let us worship worship God. God. Let us all join together for our opening hymn 54. Make a joyful noise to God. Please be seated. Jesus teaches first by example. The one who says, do not judge but forgive, asks only of us what he has already done for us. Let us practice the teacher's instruction in prayer using the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin and on the screen. O Christ, the economy of your love is beautiful, expanding goodness and extending lines of forgiveness beyond our imagining. The economy of our love is stingy and crooked. We invest love where it can be repaid. We spend mercy where it yields gain. We advance blessing we can bank on. 
We hold grudges with interest. We do all of this with no recognition of how deeply indebted we are to you. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We pray with our whole hearts. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, our weakness gives way to power. Our dishonor disintegrates into glory, and we are raised with Christ. This is gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. like to come forward for children's church or whatever we call it <laughs> talk with the children watch out for everybody yo everybody I'm talking to everybody everybody needs to avoid everybody go back to where you are I will thank you watch out yo Oh.
no. Hello, everybody. Jeez. That was delightful. <laughs> Children bring a smile to your face, that's for sure. How are you guys doing today? All right, now I just wanted to talk about one thing today, because today you guys are going to be doing a collection for us. I hope you all brought a bunch of money. Did everybody bring money? You left your wallet? You left your wallet in the offering plate? No? Did you bring, everybody brought their money, right? No, so let's see. So instead, you know how you're going to be... 60, that's perfect. Well, however many it is, it's perfect. So um, today what we're going to do is we're going to do a collection of change. And you guys are all going to get buckets. And you're going to run around the sanctuary. And people who have change and would like to give it are going to put that change in your buckets. Right? Now we're going to do this every couple months. And today's the first time. So I bet everybody, like Dick said, didn't remember to bring their change. But... I bet next time it's going to be so loud with change. And do you know why we're doing this collection? Anybody know? Anybody here? Anybody here from the announcement earlier? What You heard it good. What did you hear? You don't know. It's for the food pantry. Our food pantry. And if you guys have not seen the food pantry, you guys should ask your parents to go see it. Because this church is, I know you've been to the food pantry. Our church has a big food pantry that serves food to people. Because all you guys probably eat, right? Yeah. Do you eat two, three, four times a day? Six, that sounds about right. I usually eat lunch and dinner and then like a third dinner. And no breakfast, but that's okay. So we're going to be doing this collection. And we're going to keep doing this collection every couple of months. Because all of our change and all of our single dollars and all of our big checks and all of our everything counts. And what they're going to do with this money is they're going to buy fun things for people to eat. I say fun things, but here's the list of things. Ketchup. Mayonnaise. I Salad. Good things. They're going to get different things because when you uh, don't have enough money to pay for everything, because everything costs money, right? You have to buy all of the stuff that we own. Sometimes people are left without food. And sometimes people are left only getting one meal a day. Sometimes people want three, but they only get two. Sometimes they have to share with their brothers and sisters food that's meant just for them. Sometimes we did a program at my last church where we brought backpacks were full of food and we gave them to kids who didn't have food on the weekends. And there was one person I'd like to tell you about who asked us over and over again if we could not use the backpacks. And she kept le leaving her food at the school. And she would leave her food at the school on Fridays and then pick them up on Mondays. And so we'd say, why do you keep leaving your food on Fridays? Don't you want the food for the weekends? And some of us started thinking that maybe this girl really didn't need food at all. Because we got a backpack full of food, we gave it to her, and this was supposed to be her food for the whole weekend. And she would never take it home. And eventually she told us why. She told us it was because her mom's boyfriend knew what was in that backpack and knew she was supposed to be getting food on Fridays and would always take it from her, would take her food. So she would have no food all weekend. And so she decided it was better to leave it at school than to give it to him. She decided it was better to not use the backpack and to take it home on Monday because he wasn't expecting it then. A lot of people live in very scary ways. And a lot of people live with folks that don't love them as much as your moms and dads and parents and grandparents do. And one way we can help them with that is by providing them with food. And that's what this sensibility offering does. So when we look at our money, and I just have a couple dollars here. When we look at our money, we might think, oh, that's a couple pieces of gum. Or we might think, oh, that's a pop from the pop machine. Or maybe it's something to put in my piggy bank. 
But maybe it'd be better if we thought of it like a meal for a kid that doesn't get any food all weekend long. Okay? So let's pray for those people, okay? And then I think we're going to get our, our buckets and we're going to go around and do the collection. Lord, we know that there's people in this town that don't have food. And it's for many different reasons. There are many different reasons that people don't have food, but, and we might disagree with some of them, but Lord, we know that we all need to eat. We pray that the money we provide, that the food we provide, make it to every single person, every man, every woman, and every child that needs food in this town. We pray for our collection, that it be multiplied, so that it gives, provides enough food for the people in this town because we know we need it, and because we know that it displays the love of Jesus to them. Amen? Okay, now I think, wait, wait for Deborah. Deborah's going to come over. I know you are, Yoz. Now remember, we're going to do this every couple months. Okay, you're good. Okay, make sure you get to everybody. Ready? And then it's time for junior church after that. Oh, you're going to take, well, I'll give you one. Uh, you get my money. All right, fine. All right, be careful. Walk around. Try to get to every person. Hey, no, no. Can you go walk with Calvin? Go walk with Calvin. Calvin, can you walk with Noah, please? Listen to that. It's good to see the sensibility giving come back again. Our first scripture reading is from Matthew 12, verses 1 through 14. It's in your pew Bible on uh, page 1514. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple, desecrate the Sabbath, and yet are innocent. I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I deserve mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, as sound as the other. But the Pharisees were out, went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus.
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, so today we actually have quite a bit of scripture today, but um, so I hope we can all keep up and keep along, and I have a little bit of a different sermon in that it's, it's uh, almost completely written out, so I haven't done that in a long time. But I wanted to make sure that I was accurate and true because I think it's an important topic. So the question today was basically uncomfortable Old Testament stories. Uncomfortable Old Testament stories. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you haven't read the Old Testament in a while. Because there are some scary stories in there. There are stories that I think, personally, are a little bit frightening. And the New Testament has a lot less of them. Well, granted, the New Testament has a lot less, but there's still a couple uh, in there. But we're talking about the stories in which they, people are cut up and mailed to different parts of communities. We're talking about times and stories of war brides. We're talking about times and stories of, of slavery and things in which people who seem to have committed very minor offenses are put to death. We're talking about these stories of incense and stories of all sorts of things that we tend to cringe at if we read them for what they truly are, or at least what they truly say. And so what do we do with those stories? What do we do with those uncomfortable stories? Do we just forget about them? Do we say that they're from a different time and place? What do we do about them? So today we are continuing our series and sermon series on faith questions and talking about all those questions that you have sent and submitted. And the question for today are, what about all these disgusting or appalling or off-putting or uncomfortable Old Testament stories? Stories of violence, of devious sexual activity, of extreme violence, of God demanding his people to kill. What do we do with the social issues that the Old Testament is on the wrong side of? One of the things that uh, was uh, always a fun conversation in Newark, is in Newark, we had a first Presbyterian and a second Presbyterian, and they were within a block of each other. And so we would always have these discussions, and people would call us, and I'd say, no, you want the other one. And they'd call us, they'd call them, and they'd say, oh, you want us. And they would always get mad, because I'd say, whenever I was interacting with someone with second, that I'm from first Presbyterian, first for a reason. And they would get a little salty about that. But they would win because then they would ask the question, what was the dividing, the dividing topic that divided the church that hundred odd years ago? And then I'd have to say, slavery. Well, what side was Newark first on? The wrong side. I'll tell you that. The other argument there was on uh, baptized or rather unbaptized babies and where unbaptized babies go when they die and of course Newark was on the wrong side of that one too. What do we do with all these things? What do we do with stories that are completely incompatible with a God that we know who sent Jesus to die for our sins? And when I was doing research for this question it seemed like most folks tried to take each and every story on one at a time, and that would be too long. Obviously, that would be a good thing to do, but what I thought would be maybe better is to come up with a few tools that can help us understand most of these stories. Still not all. Still not all. Most of these stories, or at least stories that I have trouble with, and so I have a framework of understanding that I believe we always have to keep in mind when we read the Old Testament, and then I have a few correlating parts. But this, I think, is very important. I believe that when we read the Bible, we must treat all human history, all of human history, as if it is one person. We need to treat all of human history as if it is one person. 
And that's the framework of understanding that I believe we should always have in the back of our mind whenever we read the Bible. Especially when we see things where, well, maybe what God said originally seems a little different than what God says now. Again, we should treat all human history as if it is one person. And so what I'm saying here is that humanity is born with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is therefore like a baby. And God treats them like babies. Adam and Eve, they're given free reign and had very little expected of them. They could do literally no wrong. There was only one thing God told them not to do, and that was to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it would hurt them. And as a young child, you don't necessarily punish a young child. You don't punish a young child. The adult's job is to keep them safe, to provide for their needs. When my children are small, I expect less of them. It is my job to provide for them. It is my job to keep them safe. It is my job to build a foundation that we can work from. Yet, if they do something that could hurt them, then the adult must act quickly and sufficiently to make sure that that child knows how dangerous the action is. When Noah, or really Blake, I try not to pick on it, but when Blake goes to put his finger in that electrical socket, he has to be made quickly aware that that is a bad idea. I can't wait till tomorrow and talk to him about it. I have to show him with maybe a smack, maybe whatever you'd like to do, whatever you think, but we have to make him aware quickly. And we have to make him aware quickly that what he was doing or what he was going to do is dangerous and a bad idea. And that's what God's doing. In Eden, God provided all of their needs. God protected them from what could hurt them. And when they went for the root, for the fruit, God removed all possibility that he could hurt them anymore, by, hurt themselves anymore by eating the tree of eternal life. And so he put those angels and he removed them from the possibility of hurting themselves. And it continues. And as it continues, humanity grows. And as humanity grows, the relationship with God changes. And so God has a relationship with Abraham. And here, God expected Abraham to listen to him. Abraham is to follow God's lead. However, that's all that's expected of Abraham. Abraham didn't have the law. He didn't have worship requirements. It was just, Abraham, listen to me. And as a parent, that's what you do with younger children. We expect them to follow basic rules. We expect them to listen to us. We expect them to understand that we know best, which I we expect them to understand what we know best, and as the children grow, our expectations grow. And humanity grows a little more when we come to Moses. And here we have rules now. Here humanity is given the law, they're given rules and requirements. Here Israel is expected to understand what God wants, not just follow a simple set of rules. They're supposed to understand what God wants. Now they're expected to help. Here, they're given a level of autonomy. More have expected them, and more freedom is given to them. And as a parent, maybe this is more similar to teenagers. We give them rules, but we also explain why. We give them boundaries. We give them freedom. Here, we're getting closer to treating them like adults. We're their parents, but what are we doing? We're grooming them. For independence and we can even see this in the punishments the punishments are changing so when Israel is set into exile it's the same as when parents say as long as you live under my roof you're gonna follow my rules as a parent there becomes an age on which it's okay to tell your child that they have to live up to expectations they have to respect your wishes or they have to be on their own and humanity is edging closer to that independence through Moses, through the time of judges, through the time of kings, through the time of the prophets. 
Now, I will say that I don't think humanity ever gets too much past their early 20s. At least, at least how I experienced my early 20s. In so many ways, you are on your own, right? You have great independence, but also great expectations. And the punishments no longer come in the form of timeouts or corporal punishments, but in the form of consequences. If you don't spend your money wisely, you're going to be in debt. If you don't fulfill your obligations, you're going to lose your job. If you don't do what you need to do, you will get evicted. If you do foolish things, you'll end up with fines and tickets. If you don't treat your body right, illnesses. If you waste your time or don't work hard, you end up with a bad job. Your rewards also come in the form of consequences. Put in the effort, have a good marriage. Spend the time honing your craft, get a better job, or at least that's our hope. Yet for all the independence and all the personal effort you put in, you still owe everything to your parents. And you probably have a few things happen that you couldn't have survived on your own, at least without great loss. The day you finally give up and you just say, Mommy, this is the Christian experience as I see it right now. You owe everything to God. There are multiple times and seasons that you could not have gotten through without great loss. If you did not have God, you, maybe you could have gotten through it, but not without great loss. You have independence on how you live your life. It is up to you. Your rewards and punishments, they come in the form of consequences. Live your life in the way God intended for you to live, and you'll receive good things. Live counter to that way, live counter to the way that you're designed, and you don't get those good things. We will never know the blessings we have missed out on because we have lived counter to God's will. So we must understand that the Bible is a story of the relationship of humanity and God. And we must understand all human history as if it's one person. So that's sort of the framework that I believe we read the Bible in. That sort of, to me, shows and proves and explains how God changes punishments over time. How God changes how he interacts with us over time. How God changes his expectations of us over time. That's the framework. So let's move on to some points. So the first point, or the first correlating point, is to remember that the Old Testament punishes, punishment comes quickly and physically. So just as punishment would come from an adult to a young child. And this is 1 Kings 18, and it's the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on wood but not set it on fire. I will prepare the other bull and put it on wood but not set it on fire. And then you call in the name of your God and I will call in the name of my God and the God who answers by fire, he is God. So here are the prophets of Baal. They tried all day and nothing happened. And Elijah made one prayer and God sent fire. And that fire came down and it burnt the sacrifice. And then Elijah commanded that all 450 prophets of Baal be killed and they were. These prophets followed Baal. They ignored the one true God and they were punished with death. Elijah killed 450 people. I know that they were following false gods, but I would never imagine doing that. Killing folks for other religions, though of course many have. We look at folks like ISIS and we call them the most evil of people. We look at the Crusades and the Spanish Inquisition as evil times in the church. Yet here Elijah is a hero of the faith for killing 450 people. To me that's appalling. God doesn't work like that. So the first thing, though, we need to remember is that in the Old Testament, punishment comes quickly and physically. But let's look. Let's look about now. 
This is uh, Revelation 21, 6. And it says, He said to me, It is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But to the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderous, the sexually immoral, those who participate in magic arts, the adulterers, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. We say almost every Sunday in church that the punishment of sin is death. We say all the time that the results of a life led in opposition to God is death. And the only real difference here is when the punishments happen. The only real difference here between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is timing. The prophets in the story of Elijah were punished with death through Elijah that moment. Individuals today living still have death hanging over their heads. It'll just come through the end times. And this fits right in with this understanding that God in humanity, it's all one person. When you're younger, punishments have to come quickly. If I punish my children today for something they did a week ago, they wouldn't get it. It wouldn't make sense. They wouldn't understand why they were being punished. But as an adult, I can make that connection. I'm being fired for what I did a month ago. Here's the second one, and I think this is a lot more helpful. We cannot assume the people were right. The Bible is the story of the relationship of humanity and God. And as we said further back, back in time, as we said further back, the further back we go in time, the more we go into that relationship. The more that relationship resembles a parent and a young child. How often do children think they are doing the right thing when they're not? The concrete lesson here is to look for what God thought about any given story. So we're looking at the Bible and we're reading through these stories. We have to remember that much of the Bible is history. Much of the Bible is a story of what happened. It's a story of what happened in God's relationship with humanity, and not all of it is what God wanted. Not all of it is what God said was right. It is something that happened. And so when we look at these stories that we find appalling, or we look at these stories that we find confusing or uncomfortable, we must first ask ourselves, is this just historical fact, or, it is some, or is it something God wanted to have happen? Was God happy that this happened? Does the scripture say, and God was pleased? Does it say that it made God angry? Does it say that God told them to do it? Is God even mentioned? So much of this Bible is history. And sometimes the Bible is just telling a story without narrative as to its morality. And this is Genesis 19, and I see it as a good example. Lot and his daughters have escaped the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and there are no men around. And because there's no men around, they decide that they should get their dad drunk and have children with him. They do. That's a gross story. But listen to the last few verses of chapter 19 and 20. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab, and he was the father of the Moabites of today. The younger daughter also had a son, and she named him Ben-Ami, and he is the father of the Ammonites today. Now Abraham moved on, now Abraham moved on from where there into the region of Negev and lived between Kashur and Shur for a while and stayed in Gerar. Read the whole story for yourself, but there is no reference as to whether or not this was a good or a bad thing. It just happened. It just happened. Just because there is a story in the Bible doesn't mean that God necessarily thinks it's good. Just because there's a story in the Bible doesn't mean that God said that it was right. 
Let's talk about this a little bit more. This is Matthew 12 and 9 to 14. Going on from this place, he went into their synagogue, and a man had a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more are you valuable than a sheep? Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched out his hand and completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted that they might kill Jesus. Okay, so that's what Bob read. But as Christians, we know that the Jewish leaders of the day often had things so wrong. And we know today that folks all the time do terrible things in the name of God. However, we often assume that the Jewish leaders of the Old Testament were doing the right thing. Why is that? Why is that? Being wrong about what God wants, doing terrible things in the name of God, that did not start with the Pharisees. That did not start with us. Unless the story contains a clear reference to what God thought about a given situation, we need not assume that God thought they did the right thing. And in fact, I think the Bible shows us that we get it wrong at least as much as we get it right. One last point, and I think this is the most important. God took our hearts into consideration. And this is... Uh, uh, Matthew 19, 1 to 9. And I, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I go back to this. You I always go back to Romans 8. I always go back to the story of Adam and Eve. I always go back to the end of Revelations. But Matthew 19, 1 to 9 is something that I rely on very heavily. And it says this. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of, of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to test him, and they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and all reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will be one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command a man, let a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it is not that way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Because your hearts were hard. Think back to the parts of Matthew that, that Bob read and that I read a second ago. Jesus kept saying, or excuse me, we think back to the so I tell you's. Excuse me. And we have this idea and Jesus is saying, Jewish tradition has taught you this, but I tell you something else. You heard don't kill, and I say don't get angry. You want, don't get so angry you want to kill. You say eye for an eye, I say don't get revenge. This is important. Jesus is teaching, Jesus is teaching that God is adapting to what we will do. Jesus is teaching not that God changes his mind. Jesus is teaching that God has wanted all the time, but we couldn't handle in our scripture from Matthew 19, Jesus says that God wants all married people to stay that way. He created marriage to last forever, yet he allowed Moses to allow divorce because their hearts were hard. But it wasn't that way from the beginning. From the beginning, divorce was a sin, and yet God allowed it because our hearts were hard. This means that God made rules we could follow. God made rules we could follow, we could listen to, we could stay with. He took our hearts into consideration. 
He called his people to a higher standard than the world around them. He wanted more, but they weren't ready. That was the best they were ready for, and they still failed. God takes our hearts into consideration. God took our hearts into consideration in two issues the Bible is always called out on for being wrong are, are slavery and for the treatment of women. And we read the rules about, say, taking war brides, and we say, and it says, there's a, there's, a, there's a scripture, and it says about war brides, and it said that God could take, God said that they could take a wife from the people they had conquered, but he required that they allow the woman to have time to grieve. And he said that they couldn't treat them like slaves or sell them if they weren't pleased. Jesus just said that God never wanted divorce. So the rules we have from this time of war brides aren't really what God wanted. They were the best the people were ready for. God is training his people to be the people he wants them to be. He is training them. And that cannot happen overnight. What God wants is so foreign. It is so foreign for people that they couldn't live that way. You can't take a society of people that we would call evil and make holy overnight. You cannot expect children to live like grown adults, but you direct them in the right way so that one day when they are grown adults, they will live the right way. They will be fully functioning adults. And in the same way, the same is true with slavery. God made the people treat slaves better than the world around them did, but he did not require them to get rid of them. This is Paul in Philemon. It says, therefore, although in Christ... I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. And again, perhaps the reason we were separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back, the, the slave of Diphius. You might have him back forever and not as a slave, better as a slave, as a brother, as a very dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So Paul is saying to Philemon, Philemon shouldn't have Onesimus as a slave. Folks will say that slavery is wrong and God should have condemned it from the beginning, but society grows and advances all the time. We have to treat humanity as one person. And Paul says in Galatians 3, there's neither slave or Jew nor Gentile nor free nor male or female, but one in Christ. The Bible didn't condemn slavery 4,000 years ago, but it did 2,000 years ago. And it took almost that long for us to notice. Slavery wasn't abolished in the U.S. until 1865. The Civil Rights Act didn't abolish segregation until 1964. And as ridiculous as it sounds, racism is a problem today. It isn't that God was fine with slavery. It's that humanity is so sinful and disgusting that he knew we wouldn't listen, and so he developed a group of people that would. We are who we are today, and we believe what we believe today in large part because of what God has done developing the people who lived before us. We're lucky to live at a time in which we can look back at this and say, how bad were these people? We are lucky because we get to be the 20-somethings of humanity and not the little kids. So when we read the Bible, we must treat all human history as if it's one person. And because of this, we need to see that the Old Testament brings punishment quickly and physically, just as punishment would come to a, from an adult to a young child. And when we read the Bible, we must treat all human history as if it's one person. Because of this, we need to see that we should never assume that the people of the scriptures were right. When we read the Bible, we must treat all human history as if it's one person. And because of this, we need to see that God took our hearts into consideration. And I hope that helps. I hope that helps when we read the Bible, especially the parts of the Old Testament and things that take us aback. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, there is so much in the scripture that is just beautiful. And there's so much in the scripture that bothers us. 
But Lord God, I hope that we can see that in the Bible, it's not all things that you wanted to have happen that happened. A lot of it is just stories of what occurred, good and bad. But also, Lord, I pray that we can see and take this for the seriousness that it is, that you have been working since the very beginnings of time. You have been working since Adam and Eve to create a people who can live according to your will, who can live according to the good deeds that you would have us live, who can live as a people that are not separated by race or creed or religion or anything, that we are only separated by the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's all stand and sing our, our next hymn, which is uh, Spirit, Open My Heart. I'd like to ask the ushers to come forward as we prepare to give our tithes and offerings to the Lord.
Please join me in the unison prayer of dedication. Holy One, we, we give because you beckon us to give. We give because you call us to be merciful. We give because you command us to love our enemies. We give because we seek to be your followers who do good and expect nothing in return. May the offering that we place upon the altar humble us so that we do not judge or condemn, but offer a posture of forgiveness and love. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Be seated, please. I'm going to turn myself off. Nope, it didn't. Good. Our uh, prayer requests uh, today, we got a request from Annette Garland, who she had a surgery to remove a tumor in her brain, and that was successful, and it is not a cancerous tumor. That's correct, right, Ray Jean? It's not. It's, it was a, a benign tumor, right? Yes. And... Um, so she's at home, so prayers, prayers for her. And it says thank you for cards and prayers, so thank you. Um, I would also like to make note um, and to let everyone know, Isabel Stratton did pass away on Saturday. She passed away on Saturday. So she fell, in the end, she fell about eight weeks ago or nine weeks ago and uh, broke her pelvis. And then functionally, once that was uh, healed enough that um, she could move, then everything had just sort of seized up. And it was very difficult for her at that point on. So uh, prayers for her, for her family. I do know that uh, the service is going to be uh, later on. So not like months from now, but a few weeks from now. So as soon as we have the plans figured out, we will, we will put that out to everybody. Okay. And of course, make sure to note all the prayer requests and different things that are listed in your bulletin. And I would point out, in case you guys didn't see, that last week when we did the deacon collection, that was $360. So that's really great. So we're glad for that. Glad for that because I know the deacons do a lot of good work, and uh, that is helpful to be able to continue to do that um, without just taking from bank accounts. You know, I think so often the church in this day and age, um, we just sort of take from bank accounts. And some of it has to come from us, right? Some of it has to come from us. And I'm so glad and I'm so grateful for what people have saved up for us. And uh, don't, of course, we're going to use it. But also, some of it has to come from us. Some of it has to be us who are providing for the current and for the future church. So I'm ever so glad that that happened, and um, thank you for that. So let's pray. Lord God, we lift up in prayer the family of Isabel Stranton. Uh, we lift them up as they travel from Florida and uh, Minnesota and uh, other places in the country. We lift them up in prayer. Uh, I know that they have been here for close to a month from Florida, uh, being with their mom. So prayers for her, and we thank you for her life, and we pray for her at this time, and we pray for her family. We thank you that Annette's surgery went well. We pray that it continue to go well, that she heal, and that this not return to her. We pray for the work of the deacons, and thank you for it, that it can be a ministry of our church that reaches out to those within the church and outside of the church, which is the helping hand and some love. And we continue to pray by saying that which you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let's all stand and sing our closing hymn, which is Jesus Calls Us.
knowledge to go forth in the love of God, the peace of Christ Jesus, and the united power of the Holy Spirit. Amen?